I am your moderator for this discussion. A little bit about myself, I'm a program officer in the Department of Environmental and Natural Resource Program at the SAT Institute. I have a bachelor degree in geology from Federation University Australia, formerly known as University of Ballarat, and I have a master's degree in global energy and climate change from uh, SOAS University in the UK. Uh, part of my uh, work experience, I have produced several research papers in South Sudan on climate change, environmental degradation in oil fields, transparency and accountability in energy sector, gender and human right violation. And I presented these findings to a lot, uh, many of conferences, workshops and to uh, concerned policymakers. Also, as you guys might have seen, uh, I am a founder of Enjoy Your Space, uh, um, a social media platform where I create content to help women and our young men. Um, to our today, our topic of today is about access to sustainable energy options in South Sudan, consequences, challenges, and way forward. Just to give you a bit of a context um, of what we mean by sustainable development, sustainable development here, according to the United Nations, is is a way of meeting our needs of present without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own need. So how, how does sustainability relate to energy, you may ask? Sustainable energy means meeting our current energy needs without compromising the needs of our future generation, if I may put it simply. So currently, looking globally, 80% of the world energy is provided by oil, natural gas, and coal. They provide us with electricity, heat, and transportation. But if we come to our uh, South Sudan, which is the subject of our discussion today, and in Africa in general, the energy we are more familiar with is our charcoal, firewood, grass, for lighting, heating, and cooking. So before I introduce our uh, panelists in the studio and the questions that we are going to address today, um, let me just highlight um, to you that some of these energy sources I've just mentioned have been known to change our uh, weather patterns, they pollute our air and our soil, and they are killing our biodiversity and ecosystem. So our discussion today will deal on four questions. What are the major sources of our current energy uh, sources in South Sudan? Are these sources of energy sustainable? If not, what are the sustainable energy options do we have? Also, what are some of the challenges and way forwards in adapting these sustainable energy options? With me to discuss these questions, I have incredible panelists here. Um, some of us will join soon, but before they come in, I'll go ahead and introduce them. Um, here, I'll start with Census. Census is an established international environmental management professional with over 10 years of experience in consulting and project manage management in South Africa and in Sudan. She was a climate change and, and renewable energy consultant at UNDP to strengthen the UNDP environment and climate change uh, portfolio through the development of new projects on sustainable energy. She was also a project coordinator at Ebony Center for Strategic Studies where she was responsible for coordinating the Sudan South Sudan Di Dialogue Group. She has a Master's of Public Administration in, exec in Executive Leadership Development from uh, Direct University. She also has a Master's Degree in Energy, Environment and Natural Resource. Also who will join us is Nial Tid Mamer. Nial will join us soon. Uh, but while we are waiting for Nia, let me introduce Miriam. Miriam Modong Dankasuk is both an engineer and policy expert in the energy and environmental field. She is, a, she is currently working with Africa Center for Strategic Progress based in Washington, D.C. to explore ways of promoting the responsible use of energy research and environment. She previously worked as an evaluation consultant for NGO in the US, Water and Inhabited Engineer, an international humanitarian organization in South Sudan and a field engineer at a reputable multinational organization in Norway. In addition to her extensive experience, Miriam holds a bachelor degree in engineering, in chemical and processing engineering, and master's degree in environmental and energy engineering from the University of Sheffield in the UK. 
Uh, she also have an MA in Global Environment Policy from the American University. Miriam also undertook a Public Management and Energy Policy Fellowship at the University of California. Also to join us uh, is Nial um, Tid Mamer. Uh, he's, he will join us soon. Nial is the Director of Environmental and Natural Resource Program at the Sat Institute, and he is also a part-time lecturer at the University of Juba. Before joining the Sat Institute in 2013, Nial spent research and consulting at Atlet Environmental Consulting in Calgary. He holds a Bachelor Degree in Environmental Studies with minor in English lit Literature from the University of Alberta. And um, then he has a master's degree in sustainable energy development from University of Calgary in Canada. Nial is the co-founder of the New Sudan Vision.com and has extensively commented and written on issues about South Sudan and Sudan. Also to join us will be Nemaj Hothmai. She has a bachelor degree in natural resource management from African Nazarene University in Kenya. She is the founder of Future Servers Network and the chairperson of Consortium of Youth Organization for Local Intervention. Nemaj is currently working as a sectional head for safety in Nile, Pet, uh, Nile Petroleum Corporation and currently pursuing her master's in natural resource management and environmental studies. We are having technical um, a problem a little bit from Juba. So Nial and Nyamat are, are, um, are, are logging in and they will join us soon. But to start our conversation, um, first I will go um, to you, Miriam. Thank you for, thank you ladies for, um, for joining us today. And Miriam, my first question uh, will go to you. Can you run us through a brief detail of the current energy source, including consumption level, demand and install capacity for various purposes, including lighting, heating, cooling, cooking, and transformation, among others in South Sudan? Um, to you. Thank you, Nyathon, for inviting me to this um, discussion. Um, the current energy sources, um, especially in Juba, include uh, rooftop solar. So most uh, households uh, have installed that. Then there's uh, diesel generators uh, uh, for electricity, um, used for heating, lighting, um, cooling in the house. And uh, also most of the uh, NGOs and cars also use generators. Then we have um, LPG gas and charcoal for cooking. And in some rural areas, uh, we they use firewood. For transportation, it's mostly fossil fuels, and that is uh, petrol uh, and diesel. We also have electricity being supplied in Juba. It's from Ezra, and the installed capacity is 33 megawatts operational, and it's being distributed by Jetco. Outside of Juba, uh, areas such as Ye, Reng, Kapueta, Por, Malakal, and Wau have also access to electricity, uh, as mentioned in a previous webinar. Um, and uh, earlier this year, there was a South Sudan Oil and Power 2021 conference where the Ministry of um, Energy and Dams mentioned that there's an ongoing construction of a 20 megawatt uh, solar power plant at Nesitu which will be commissioned uh, by March, 2022, so next year. So this is another um, um, centralized source of energy that will be provided to the country. There's also um, plans, you also mentioned that there's plan for high voltage transmission line from Uganda to Nimule and to Juba. And also currently Trinity Energy, it's co is constructing a generation and distribution network in WOW. So all that is uh, uh, provide the sources for, for energy in the country. But I will say that uh, in general, the decentralized uh, diesel generators um, using the fossil fuels are the most widely used source of electricity or energy in the country, especially in Juba. And we all know how this contributes to climate change by adding um, tons of CO2 pollution. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Miriam, for sort of uh, setting our, um, our context into what we are talking about today. Um, just to let you know our views as well, we're still having technical problem um, in accessing internet. 
And so Nyamaj and Nial are still trying to get in um, to join us. And so I'll go to you. Let's, while we're waiting for Nial and Nyamaj, um, I would like you, Miriam, or uh, Census, one of you to jump in and sort of take us through what are some of the environmental issues that you think are related, Miriam, as you've just explained to us, most of our energy source, electroelectricity, or transportation are based on fossil fuel. And also in addition as well, you know, we use coal, we use lighting, I mean, coal for cooking. I mean, we use charcoal for cooking and for lighting. So which one of you just add one point or two, what are some of the environmental issues associated with this source of energy? I'll start with you, Census, and then Miriam. Um, oh, am I on? Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, this is Census Lo Leong, and thank you very much for bringing me into this interesting forum on um, sustainable energy use. One of the major impacts that we have seen um, regarding energy, especially the different sources that um, Miriam had just men mentioned, um, is well, when, you know, a lot of people who use currently charcoal is that that leads to an increase in the CO2 levels that are in the world, as well as the amount of smoke. Um, smoke is also a pollutant. Um, so there is an increase of um, pollutants in the environment. Um, and I think one thing we should also remember is that for us to use charcoal, we have to burn wood. And wood is from trees. So if you look across South Sudan, we have areas where the largest production of charcoal comes from. But if you've ever flown over South Sudan, you are also able to see the amount of burning that's going on. And the fact that a lot of trees are being cut at a much younger age. They are not allowed to actually grow into fully fledged trees that give you even high quality charcoal. So by the time a tree is about three or so meters, you find all of this is already cut. Um, what's what ends up happening is that there is a fast a forced change in the climatic structure of the region that that those areas are in um, as opposed to having land cover you end up having grounds that are depleted um, trees no trees and remember trees also help in terms of keeping the soil structure you know in terms of their roots they keep the the, the, they keep the soil in those areas in the ground. When you burn a whole lot of it, you've also depleted the soil, but within doing that, you are also allowing to an increased amount of erosion. So when there are floods, you don't have structures that are able to somehow decrease or slow down um, the water source um, in those areas, the water flow. Um, so I think that those are just about two or three points I'll give. I'm going to leave the rest to Miriam to continue. Thank you very much. Miriam, Miriam before you jump in, I would like to welcome Nial. Uh, Nial, uh, welcome. We've already started the conversation. We have, we have introduced um, you guys already. Um, so we are actually now uh, on the point of what are some of the environmental issues associated with um, source of energy uh, that we are currently using in South Sudan. So Nian, I'm going to put you straight on the spot, <laughs> right? Miriam, you'll add your point later, but I'm just going to jump to you, Nial, and sort of take us through. Census have already mentioned some, but we'd we'll like to hear from you as well. What are some of the environmental issues associated with various sources of energy in South Sudan? So to you, Nial, yes. Uh, we can hear you, unmute yourself. And we can hear you, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. You can hear me? Hello? Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can now. Welcome. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be part of this important uh, discussion on an important topic, uh, topic that is uh, uh, very crucial for the progress of our society. You know, there are very serious issues associated with uh, the current use of energy in South Sudan, as you can you remember. Uh, the forms of energy we use now in South Sudan, they are uh, mostly traditional and, and dirty uh, fuels. 
uh, and of course plus uh, wood fuels too, uh, which which are very dirty and they have been detrimental to the environment and to the health of the people of South Sudan. So for example, we are using uh, diesel, uh, which is also fossil fuel, which causes uh, pollution, causes air pollution. Also, uh, it leaks and is also causing um, uh, pollution related to sanitation, especially water, because some of these uh, uh, leak oil is washed into the rivers. And also, we are also um, facing a lot of issues with with the, the charcoal burning, uh, which is also very detrimental to, to the health of people. And in fact, um, in South Sudan, uh, we are much affected by uh, pollution related to, 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 to air and, and also to, to, to sanitation. And all this is coming from indoor pollution because most of our cooking energy is either uh, waste crops, uh, like the residu residue of, of, of crops, uh, which generate a lot of uh, indoor pollution, or charcoal itself, uh, which, which is much, of course much cleaner, but it's still not clean. So all these, they, they cause uh, a lot of pollution. And in now South Sudan is ranked number five in Africa in terms of the rate of pollution per 100,000 people. So for every, for every 100,000 population in South Sudan, there is about 180 deaths related to pollution. Uh, and all this is caused by indoor pollution basically. And much of this affects women and children because this segment of the society is the one that mm, uh, is mm. most, most exposed through cooking, cooking indoor, and also cooking using these uh, forms of, of energy. And this, this, is, this is a huge problem. And so when I say South Sudan is number five in Africa in terms of the, the desert related to, uh, to, to pollution, we are also number seven in the world in terms of the same desert related to pollution. But, uh, when I'm comparing this, I'm just talking about the proportion of population. So if you have 100,000 people, so out of 180 people who die of pollution related diseases. If you compare this to uh, highly populated countries like China and India, which are the leading countries in terms of the total deaths, uh, of course, then it is, a, it is a different case. But for the population proportion, we, we are among the, the top 10 countries in the world. And it's simply because of the form of energy that we are using. So pollution is a very serious matter in South Sudan, and it is serious because of the form of energy that we are using. We are supposed to use uh, clean sources such as, um, uh, you know, cooking gas is, is much cleaner. Electricity is also much cleaner. Electricity from, uh, you know, hydropower, uh, and from other, other sources is much better. But currently our forms of energy are very uh, rudimental and, um, and they are not clean and they are dirty and they are very uh, negatively mm -hmm. impact, impacting on our population. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, thank you so much, Neil. And I really like the fact that you really touch on, on the health impact associated with the use of charcoal. And I think it's very good that we dwell a little bit on this question a little bit before we move on to our next question. Uh, I think most of us, my myself as well, I've had relatives, even kids just recently, a kid who died out of, uh, because a mother lit the charcoal mm -hmm. and then sort of left, left the charcoal burning at night, in, I mean, in the evening in the room because they were cold. So they used that as a source of heat. And I think there was a carbon monoxide um, poisoning that took place. And so right. basically the mother and the children collapsed in the, in, in the room. Like they were not able to wake up, nothing was happening until the father has to call from Juba and call the neighbor to go and check with them because no one, nobody was responding. Unfortunately, it happened that the child died 
but the mother and the other two kids were rescued and they were taken to the hospital. And this is very important that we discuss a little bit about this so that we create awareness as well and say that charcoal is good, but it has um, health impact in terms of um, death. You know, it can kill, it can kill people. So I don't know, um, does anybody want to add anything on this topic or should we just move on to our next topic? But I think it's very good that you really brought up um, this issue of indoor uh, pollution on charcoal. Um, I would like to add a few points. I think what I want to bring forward is that it's not only charcoal that ends up causing um, carbon monoxide poisoning, but also wood. Uh, if you've been to the village, I know sometimes when I go to the village, we use wood, not charcoal. Um, so literally a branch of a tree that's been cut would be lit and the kitchens are very tiny. Um, I don't know if you have seen for some reason the way we construct our kitchens and perhaps that is because we're worried about animals coming or something like that. The shape of the hat are a bit lower for the kitchens and smaller, it's not very spacious. And secondly, you end up finding that they don't have any windows or avenues for air to escape except for the door. Uh, so usually the thick branch of wood would be burned inside the hat. And it brings out so much smoke, the amount of smoke you get from wood is worse than what you get from charcoal. So much smoke, and especially if the areas are cold, sometimes people sleep around that area without them switch, without them um, putting water on it. That also leads to carbon monoxide poisoning. So that's one, one big issue that happens. And I think for awareness purposes, we need more ventil ventilation. I think the big point here is ventilation. So if you have a kitchen, please have windows um, there. If you're worried about it being low that people will be able to access your house, have them on top next to the ceiling um, next to the roof of the hat, have some kind of opening to allow air to exit out. Even if it's in a brick walled house, make sure that there are windows as well and that you don't constantly close the door. So that's something to, to bring forward. Secondly, don't leave kids around. I, I think the biggest issue is that a lot of us when we're cooking, and especially mothers, perhaps because we don't have other people to help us with our children, we end up having them sit next to us or they run to come and sit next to us while we are cooking. Um, and it's not only carbon monoxide poisoning, it's also that people have fallen in the fire, you know, they've had accidents or things that have been cooked suddenly slipped and spilled on a child or an adult. Um, so that, those are just a few points that I wanted to put forward. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Census, for that addition. I don't know, Nemach, um, can you hear us? You can hear us. Do you have a point to add before we move on to our next topic? Okay, so I think, okay. Yes, Nemachi. You can move on. Okay. I'll join the next topic here. Yeah. Okay, so Nemachi. Yes, I'll join in the next topic. Yeah. All right, okay, good. Uh, so thank you, Nial. It's good that we've talked about the indoor aspect of our type of in energy we are using. The other thing that um, you mentioned, census earlier, is about the certification that results from the use of charcoal because we are cutting down our trees and that leads to flood and things like that. I would like us to, and now that will go to you, I would like us to sort of, what are some of the, how is this related to climate change when it comes to the use of either the fossil fuel or the biomass, which charcoal, firewood and stuff are related how is it related to uh, climate change and what are some of the impacts that we are currently facing? Nia, can, is it can to me? Yes. Okay, thank so when you very it comes much. To climate change, how, is this, how, does it, how is it related to climate change? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the issue of uh, charcoal production in South Sudan, tree cutting and all those. Uh, you know, all these things are related to climate change in the sense that uh, climate change is, is caused by global warming, global warming caused by the accumulation of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And of course, the greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, is um, absorbed by the trees. 
And um, so our contribution in South Sudan, if, if we are cutting our trees, the, the amount of carbon dioxide that we are supposed to, that the land is supposed to absorb through trees um, is going to be less because we are cutting more trees now uh, than ever before. The rate of cutting is, is increasing uh, with the movement of people to urban areas, to you know, IDP camps, and to population centers where they are not able, able to access the traditional sources of energy, such as the the normal, you know, sources like uh, the you know firewood, you know, which is not uh, you know obtained by cutting the tree. But now people have to use uh, charcoal, so more people are using charcoal, and more uh, people are using it for commercial purposes and for export. And so this is reducing our our capacity to absorb the carbon dioxide. And this is basically is contributing to the global uh, warming uh, and, and eventually of course to climate change. And let me just underscore the fact that our contribution in South Sudan uh, is of course insignificant if it is co compared with the global uh, emission of uh, greenhouse gases. But of course, if you add our insignificant contribution, insignificant contribution from another country like that, it all combines to, to create a huge uh, impact. So we in South Sudan are supposed to focus more on adaptation uh, measures to build resilience capacity uh, in South Sudan. And of course, uh, because the, the, the climate change impact now is affecting us in terms of flooding and in terms of droughts and in terms of extreme temperatures, like uh, temperatures are increasing. And so this is where we are going to, we are supposed to pay attention, of course, and also as we develop, we are supposed to use uh, mechanisms that can reduce uh, the, the emissions uh, significantly, because if we are going to develop at the same rate as the other countries which have already developed, then South Sudan is going to be a significant contributor even though we are not a, a significant contributor now to greenhouse gases. Uh, and so, so this is an important thing to be underscored. So while at the moment we are not contributing significantly to the greenhouse gases, if we are going to, to develop in the next 10 years, 20 years, uh, and we want to be like other countries which have developed, and we are using traditional means of development, it means that South Sudan is going to significantly cause damage to the, to the, to, 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 to the climate uh, impact uh, or to the, to, to the climate, uh, the global climate basically. And so it is important that we, at, while we are adapting, we also have to use mitigation measures to use clean sources of energy. That means we actually avoid uh, using uh, diesel fuel uh, or, um, generation of power or electricity using uh, diesel. And then we adapt, you know, clean sources such as hydropower. We have a lot of uh, very important big potential sites in South Sudan along the Nile. Between Juba, we have uh, three, uh, four big sites actually. Fula, we usually talk about Fula, but we have other big sites such as uh, Bedan, uh, Lukoli, and Chokoli, and, 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 and Laki. These are very big uh, sites, and um, and so if we focus, if we had focus on these things, even from the beginning, from 2005, by now we have been producing uh, our our electricity from all clean sources without using uh, fossil fuel. So so it is very very important uh, to keep this in mind. And of course, as I you know, the the previous question also brought up, brought up something very important also like uh, <coughs> so our. Very important economic activity now is the oil, which of course is an energy source and is also contributing to, to the emission of greenhouse gases. So if you look at the contribution of South Sudan now, much of it's coming from transport and from the generation of, uh, of, uh, of energy, basically. And of course, other impacts other than the, the air pollution, we know what is happening in uh, Nathan, and um, yeah, much and <clears throat> and since as all of you have been to the the oil producing areas, and we all have witnessed uh, what is happening there, is uh, catastrophic. 
uh, to say the least. And so our, 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 our energy sources uh, at the moment are, are not good for our uh, well-being as a country. We have to actually do something to, to, to adapt to, to clean energy options. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nial. And just before I go to a little bit more on the impact of what is happening on oil field, I will really, what I'm hearing from you is the fact that we are not contributing in terms when it comes to um, greenhouse gas that is now warming up the climate and changing our climate. But what I'm hearing is that we are at the receiving end of the impact of this, uh, the impact of this energy source globally, we are receiving end of the impact. But what is right. happening here, our own sources of energy sector is more actually uh, affecting us at the local environment within the country, right? We've talked of you know, the indoor pollution, we've talked of our air and our rivers, our soils are being contaminated in the type of the, of the energy we're actually using within the country, right? So, um, it's so this is what I'm, I'm getting uh, from, from your conversation. But when we talk of the impact of the climate change, and I really want us to sort of zoom that a little bit in because now we are facing the issue of flood. And a lot of our people think that the flood is being caused by God or some, you know, we don't really relate some what are causing some of this issue because now we see flood, especially in the jungle area and other flood uh, prone areas, we are suffering flood. Um, can somebody just give us, uh, very briefly, because we are uh, behind our time on this topic, is that how does flood relate to climate change? And, that, and then so that we see as well some of the energy sources are actually contributing to the suffering that we are happy, uh, currently going through. Senses, I'll start with you, and then Niall will add in um, a bit. To start off, I think I just want to give us a breakdown of um, where the jungle flood comes from. So as part of the Nile River, we are in the receiving end of where the river flows from, all the way from Tanzania into Uganda and all the various countries it goes through. What's happened is that in Uganda, we have um, the dam in Jinja. And as that dam, as rainfall increases, you know, a dam is an embankment. Once the water flow expands, increases too high, Uganda opens up the, the dam wall so the water can come through. And then you have a situation where there is high amount of water that is rushing at such a high speed coming across the Nile all the way into the Jongole region and the further regions. But the issue here that Jongole is a lowland. Now, unlike when, when the Nile comes through the equatorial region, you find that there are a lot of rapids, but also it's like rocks and mountains. Um, which allows for the water to remain within some kind of a V-shaped structure as it goes through this sort of valleys that it goes through. Once it arrives at Jongole, Jongole is a low land. The level, the normal level of the water is literally the normal level of the land if you've gone to the set. Um, once there is a high amount of rainfall, that already means it all spills over on the land. And due to the lack of structures, whether it's embankments along dikes along the river or just various structures to try and change the elevation of the land. Um, none of that exists in Jongole. So that leads to the amount of flooding that consistently keep happening. But then at a global level, what climate change has done is that it's increased the rate of change that's happening. Um, so our weather patterns have become more erat erratic as opposed to events that happen every 50, every 100 years. Um, we find that they're now happening at a much more regular level. So even within the flooding zones, you know, usually within rivers, we have what's known as a 50-year, 100-year flood line. Um, and this is the expectation that this is the highest amount this river ever floods within that period. But now all of this is more erratic, which means it's now happening at a more regular level. Regular level. Um, and with that understanding of the fact that we now have such erratic climate change, of course, we in the receiving end have to be more mindful and start thinking what structures do we need to try and decrease the amount of impact because it's going to happen and continue to happen. Um, Jongole is going to be flooded every year. Okay, you're going to have IDPs, people moving out of there every year, people affected, wildlife, 
um, flooded, drowning wild livestock as well. This is going to be happening. This is the reality that we have to go into. So how do we even prepare? Our mindset needs to now move into preparing for these events that are coming, whether it's having early warning systems so we, are, we know in advance when we're receiving these rains and if we need to move people, start doing that. Or, and also moving into expanding on the type of structures that we have along our river embankment system and also roads and expanding, perhaps lifting certain areas a bit higher just to try and decrease the amount of water coming in to the inland. Um, that would be what I can add into it. I'm going to let Nial continue. Yes. Yes, and I just want our viewers to sort of know we're, we're trying to relate, you know, some of the climate problems that we are happening and how that relate to the sources of energy we are using in our country. And, and I just like the fact that census, you've sort of seen that what is global, the climate change that is happening at the global level, is intersecting with our form of energy that we use. And that's, for example, the charcoal. Because now, since we've seen that globally, the, you know, the rainforest, I mean, the, the, the flooded are increasing. And at the same time, our rate of use, I mean, our rate of consuming charcoal is increasing. And if we are cutting down our trees, right, to provide energy for us, that is a problem, right? And these are some of the environmental uh, problems associated with the form of, of energy. Niala, I'd like you to just give a brief, um, and then we'll move on to our next question, if you have something to add. Okay, I, yeah, I think I think uh, census has uh, comprehensively uh, covered uh, most of the, the factors that are related to the consumption of production, production of energy in relation to or how it also causes the, the, the emissions of greenhouse gases and climate change and all those things. So what I would just like to emphasize is that to our viewers and to people who may not be familiar with this uh, topic, is that it is usually confusing when people are talking about global warming, climate change, and also greenhouse gases. You know, people think about when America is emitting uh, greenhouse gases, how does it affect South Sudan? And when Europe is doing that, how does it affect South Sudan? So let me just begin with uh, how we are affected here in South Sudan. And I've already said uh, that South Sudan is not contributing uh, significantly in terms of the, 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 the percentage of greenhouse gases. So if, 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 if South Sudan was the only country in the world, then of course we would have no uh, climate change, of course. So, but whatever that we, con we, we, con we produce now, will along the way as what our development is progressing will also be very significant. But that's not the point. The point is that we are the culprit, we are the victim of what is happening in the global north. America in the West, which are the industrialized countries that are producing uh, you know, greenhouse gases from energy sources such as the coal. We don't have coal in South Sudan, such as um, uh, oil, which we have in South Sudan. So we are also contributing, of course, even though uh, our contribution is insignificant. But in South Sudan, let me add this part also in terms of how climate change is affecting us here. So we are being affected by the increase in the temperatures uh, and Sansa has already mentioned that we have had uh, increase in the incidence of floods and, uh, and temperatures in the last uh, 100 years, actually. And um, now we have up to 1.3 uh, degrees Celsius increase uh, in terms of temp temperatures in South Sudan. And this is due to, to the increase of the amount of greenhouse gases in the at atmosphere, global greenhouse gases. Uh, and this, what, hap what, 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 what happens is that when these temperatures increase, uh, they, 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 they even increase more in places that are hot, hotter, like Africa. So in 2019, what happened is that the temperatures in the Indian Ocean, they increased by two degrees Celsius. Uh, and the Indian Ocean is the one that brings rainfall to East Africa. And it was two degrees Celsius because of global warming. It is, was because of the extra, uh, extra uh, increase because this is a normal climate variability. And so when you add the, the global warming impact, that's why we had extra two degrees Celsius, which 
we cause more rainfalls in East Africa because the, the temperatures, more temperatures lead to, to more um, evaporation of water and then to rainfalls. And this is why we had uh, more rainfalls in 2019. And then 2020 last year, there was a lot of flood, 2019. And this year also is the same thing. And of course, and so, so, so these are some of the things. And that's why I said earlier that we need to focus uh, much on the adaptation measures, which means that we have to uh, uh, do embankment on our rivers. Uh, and census has already said this. But I want to emphasize that low-lying areas in Yongle State, in Wara, in Northern Bagadal, in Afanar, in Unity, part of uh, Eastern Equatoria and Central Equatoria and Western Bagadal and uh, Western Equatoria, all these places we need to, to, to do adaptation uh, measures in terms of the dikes, in terms of the heli warning system, in terms of uh, moving to areas that are on high ground instead of living closer to the, to the rivers. And this will help us a lot. And then uh, most importantly, and, and related to this topic, is the fact that we need to really to actually move quickly to, 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 to clean our sources of energy. We need to actually exploit our potential, our hydro potential. Uh, along the Nile, we need to build the, uh, the polar dams. We, have, we need to build other, other, other sites to generate exactly. clean electricity yeah. for us and I'll for your neighbors. Thoughts. I'll hold your thoughts then, Neal, because that's our next our, 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 our next topic to um, to, yeah. to to expose. So I'll hold, just hold that thought, and then I'll come I'll come to you on that. Um, before I move on, I actually want us to sort of highlight a little bit, Neal, and you've done a lot of work. I don't know, Yamaj, if she's still having technical problem or not. Just do indicate to us that you're ready to speak, and then I'll I'll, I'll jump over to you. I think Neal as well. Some of the things that we need to highlight is the fact that me and you, and I'm sure as well, senses and Yamaj. We have done some work at the oil field and the oil field here, right? These are fossil fuels as well. This is a source of another, another energy, even though we don't use it. We use it for export, but somehow. But I want us to sort of highlight a little bit what are some of the environmental, locally, the impact of what this source of energy is actually doing to our community and also our, our environment because I think it's so good to, for us to talk about, you know, about some of the impact, and then now we can zoom out and say that, what do we do to find solutions? So Nial, very briefly, um, what, do you, what are some of the impact that our oil production is happening? It's affecting our community and the environment around there. Okay, Th thank you very much. Uh, this is an important question. Okay, so the, the, the impacts, uh, I think the most, uh, important impact, uh, or let me begin with the assets, is the, the, the producing water, the water that is separated from oil and is put into these uh, producing ponds or produce, produce water ponds. Uh, so this is uh, a very, very serious matter now in our oil fields and is the one that is affecting uh, people and of course, also the oil spills, uh, the pipelines have been uh, busting in the last uh, two years uh, because the, 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 the infrastructure is basically getting old now, especially the pipeline, uh, the one in, in Unity State and Uruguay uh, was, it was built um, like more than 20 years ago. It was supposed to to be replaced or replaced basically after 20 years. So, so it's beyond that now. And so, so, so it basically is, is leaking every now and then. And, and I'm sure you might have seen this in the media every now and then there is a leakage and, and this is reported after several days, after, you know, uh, several or thousands of uh, liters, uh, you know, spill and, and leak into the into, into the environment. So this is a serious matter. And so people get exposed to, 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 to produce water, they get exposed to, to spill um, oil through different means. And one of these is through the, the, the you know, the food. So uh, as both of us witnessed, um, when we were there in 2019, that uh, you know, cattle graze in, in the 
well feels and, and the goats and and you know and people also live there also so these people also get exposed to these also the uh, these uh, volatile organic compounds from the evaporation from the producing ponds uh, from the oil itself and all these so people get exposed to all these things and so now we have many people uh, who are experiencing uh, illnesses uh, related to cancer and people uh, who, who are encountering incidents of uh, birth defects and infertilities. And these are heartbreaking stories, you know, like when we were there last time, it was completely depressing to hear from the people uh, that, they, they, that people, they, they have been abandoned basically. Uh, you know, that the government is interested in taking oil and is not interested in protecting them. And that what have they done? Uh, they help the government protect the land so that the land is for South Sudan. Uh, and, and then, of course, when the land uh, was obtained by South Sudan, then South Sudan is extracting oil and is leaving the people. To be affected by by pollution, and so these are heartbreaking issues. So to me, these are supposed to be priorities at the moment because the more we allow uh, this pollution to, con to continue, the more it will go out of hand. By the time we we'll try to address it, it will be too expensive to to even address. It will be too expensive in terms of the life that will be lost. The life. Lives, lives are being lost already. And by the time, by the time someday, it will be too expensive in terms of the lives that will be lost, in terms of the money that will be spent on cleaning it. Like Nigeria now, after 50 years of oil pollution, and then they did the, the environmental assessment uh, that estimate the, the damage that has been done. So this damage is estimated at billions of dollars, and it's estimated to be taking 30 years to be clean completely. So we don't want to, to head to Nigerian way, but at the moment it looks like that, that we are going to, we are going to Nigerian way, mm -hmm. the Niger Delta way, and we don't want to, to go there. And it will not be too late for us to, to intervene and do something now. So this is what I will say. And, and, and this is a topic that most of you are familiar with, and I'm sure most of the viewers we are familiar with, with yeah. these, so what is needed is action. And I think the time of talking is, or, is already over. We are supposed to take action to address this matter. The truth is known. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know, Census, do you want to add something on that or do we just move? Let to... me just add something very quickly. Um, so around when was it, 2011, 2012, when South Sudan um, ended its oil um integration with Sudan and remove the Sudanese from that entity, we went through a process where we shut down. And then we had to restart the whole process again. But within that, um, I was in the petroleum ministry and we had the opportunity to visit the different sites and just understand what's going on. Um, I think we had those moments of hedge leach when there were bombings that ended up burning some of the oil sites. But then also, um, because of some of the leakages that, that have happened due to old, old mm -hmm. pipelines, due to the old pipelines, we also have that some of these places have exploded and just you, especially in Unity State, for instance, you know, you have swath of land where <clears throat> it's just burning. It's the fuel that's burning. Um, and to try and stop that process requires a full plan of how you even conduct this oil production and also perhaps where you can block lines or divert your pipelines. Um, I think one thing I, 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 I know we also tried to do when we were there regarding the producing water ponds was that we found out that even though the ponds had fences, the communities were breaking into these fences and coming in to take water from there. Um, as well as bringing their kettle to take water from there. Now, why were they doing that? Because 
water wasn't being supplied to them. They didn't have alternative sources of water. That was the easiest and fastest way of getting water. So I know one of the things that were being, was being pushed for was to increase the type of fencing that you have. And there is a lot of community awareness that's needed for people to understand that this is really detrimental to you. You know, um, it's not a, we understand you need this resource, but the cost of using this resource is, it, it, it's, it's, it's lifelong because some of it can end up being carcinogenic. So I think a lot of work needs to go on the ground to just get people to understand, to stay off these oil fields. And accountability, accountability from both um, the partners that it's not only about you producing and taking a resource out, but also looking after the community. Um, because as Niel has said, yes, those waters are polluted. They're a mixture of different um, oils and water. And also when there is all of that burning, you know, if you've seen a section of an oil feed burning, petrol burns at such a much faster rate and it takes a while for this burning to finish and that actually does contribute to, to CO2 um, because it messes up with the amount that the type of fresh air that people have around that area and then people are forced to relocate from there you know so there are all of these different side effects that come out of the um, different accidents that happen within the oil fields and I just wanted to highlight that before we move on to the next section. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I know this, I think this sub subject is so dear to our hearts because of the work that we've done. And we can, of course, uh, discuss it and sort of exhaust it. But what I just want to sort of highlight here is the fact that, and I, you know, when I started, I did define a little bit, what do we mean by sustainable energy, right? And the definition here, something sustainable, right, is something that, that um, provide our current needs without right compromising the needs of the future generation and what we've just heard from me our panelists is the fact that the sources of energy that we are currently either producing that we are using or we are producing to export that can give us either a foreign currency or other forms of things that we use for the country what we are hearing here is the fact that these sources are affecting our women are in terms of even like fertility, they're not able to give birth or they're having miscarriages. Children are being born with deformities. Mm -hmm. Women and children are inhaling, you know, the byproduct of the charcoals that we use in our houses. And also um, floods are increasing as well because we are cutting down our, our fuel. So what all these forms of, you know, of energy are doing is the fact that it's not, they are providing us with what we need now but the impact of what they're doing, right, will carry on for generations. So that does indicate that these sources of what we are using are not sustainable. These are not form of sustainable energy. And what, we are, what is happening now, right, it's not only to South Sudan. Other countries have gone through the same process. So how do we get out of this? What are some of the sustainable options do we have in South Sudan so that we get out from this dirty source of energy and go to uh, some of the clean, sustainable energy that we can use in South Sudan. Um, so we've already mentioned some of the options, Nial, you've already mentioned. So I'm going to go to you, Nial. Um, what are some, you've already mentioned that, what are some of alternative, what alternative can we have in terms of energy sources that will sort of minimize the impact of what we're experiencing now and also that will protect the you know the interests of our future generation okay thank you very much uh, you know at the moment as you put it the the sources of energy that we are using are not sustainable and this is a very serious concern and i'm sure before i came you define what sustainability mm -hmm. is. Uh, and of course, for the benefit of our viewers, let me just put this so that we are on the same line. Uh, the basic definition is usually the United Nations definition or the, 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 the Bradland Report definition, which is the sustainable development, the development that meets the needs of current generation without compromising the ability of the future generation you know, from 
you know, meeting their own uh, needs. And others actually uh, define sustainable development or sustainability as mm -hmm. of the moral in the sense that when you look at development, development is basically like an increase. People see it as an increase, a growth, like people talk about development in terms of economic growth or in terms of the growth of infrastructure like the development, development of roads, uh, increase in the building infrastructure and so many things. So it's all about people see development in terms of the, the development, in terms of the th throughput uh, quantitative increase. But I look at development in terms of qualitative improvement in the quality of the means of production. Uh, so, so that like if we are, like in South Sudan, we have a lot of cows and they are actually contributing uh, to greenhouse gases, by the way. And so if you need milk and if you produce one cow, and you have one cow that can produce uh, 10 liters of milk, instead of having 10 cows that will have huge impact on the environment, uh, that's what I would call the qualitative improvement. The same thing with the cooking stove. So if you have a cooking stove that is more qualitative in terms of it doesn't uh, affect the, the, the environment, the, 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 the house environment, the human environment around the, the kitchen, and it can do the same thing more efficiently. It can cook more efficiently. This is the kind of um, development that we will, will want. The same thing with electricity, the form of electricity that we want, that is more qualitative. So like usually we rank development or the, the energy in terms of from uh, the crop residue to, to wood, to charcoal, to of course to gas, to, to diesel, and to electricity, you know, so progressively. So if we can go to the same level where other, 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 other countries are right now, which is, uh, you know, we can either cook using gas or we can cook using electricity. This would be awesome. And it would be awesome in the sense that if we focus on clean sources, uh, we can do a mix of, you know, uh, sources. We can do hydro, uh, hydroelectricity. Uh, by embarking on mega projects uh, on the Nile hydro sites, or we can do a uh, small run of the river hydro, which are not costly. Like the, 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 the thermal plant that is now generating electricity for Juba now, uh, if, if, if we had to actually opt for the clean source, it, it would, have, would, be, would have been a great idea. You know, there is a side just south of Juba here at the logo, uh, not a lot of kilometers from there. It could it could produce the same uh, number of megawatts, almost the same number. Or other sites, there are about five sites. Samora so of Riba Hydro, source of Juba here, that we can produce to supply Juba with clean electricity, by the way. And this electricity can be extended to poorer families, it can be subsidized so that for our families can also get access. We also have, we can also produce uh, biogas from cow dung, from other sources, uh, even from, from waste. Uh, we can also do, we can embark on invest in, 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 in those things. And what do we do? If we go back to this definition of sustainable, sustainable development, so sustainability can be achieved in three ways. If the rate of extraction of resources is uh, proportionate to the rate of substitution. And substitution in this case, in terms of the non-renewable resources like oil. So if we substitute the rate of extracting the oil with the rate of developing other sources of energy, such as hydro, if we are using oil money to develop our hydro sites, to, to, to produce clean electricity, we can also invest in other sources, such as we develop tourism sector, um, I, just, I just want to just show other sources that we can also use to replace the non-renewable source. Uh, so that we, in, in, in 50 years, we may run out, uh, out of oil, but we may not run out of something to do. And this is what is meant by sustainability as we d d d define it earlier. 
So to, to me, uh, we have a lot of options. So we have, uh, you know, solar. So we can do also mini, 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 mini hydro. Uh, as I said earlier, we can also do uh, mini grids, neighborhood grids. Here in Yuba, in Yambio, in Bo, in Rumbek, in Wau, in, in Malakal. Uh, you know, so, and we can, uh, you know, open up uh, to private sector too for competition, to provide clean sources. They can build uh, solar farms. They can build uh, wind farms. They can supply, uh, you know, natural gas. Uh, as I said earlier, from, could be from um, uh, cooking, I mean, uh, cow dung. It could be from, even from petroleum uh, sources. Uh, you know, it is it, much better than, you know, using directly the, 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 the yeah. fuel oil. Mm. So, so, so these are some of the options we have, by the way. So we need to create an, an enabling environment. So let's say, for example, if you have entrepreneurs today who want to invest in uh, cooking gas, where do they get money? We need to open up uh, the, the banks. We need to create an enabling environment in terms of regulatory framework for the energy sector. Uh, also, we need to, to make uh, the conducive environment for the banking sector so that people can be given money, uh, you know, to, to start these um, benches. So this is very, 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 very crucial. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think I have taken time. So All I right. can, uh, um, thank allow. you, Neil. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Nemat, I'll come to you a bit. Um, let me, I don't know if Senses wants to add something uh, on some are the sustainable options do we have to replace the current dirty um, uh, source of energy that we have? Thank you very much, um, Nyao, for mentioning all of the different sources and as well as Nyathan. Um, so I, I just want, I, I, I believe that looking at where our country is, a very important part is perhaps understanding what exists, what doesn't exist, and how do we expand on what we're currently using? You know, I think that's very important because um, as much as it's great for us to mention all of them, we need to also understand the reality of how best we can go about it. So f first I want to start with something. Um, I think more than anything, what we um, want to Can do we all mute our mics? Just so that, just one second. Um, I think the mic is on. If we can, yeah, thank you, yeah. Continue. Um, I think I just wanted to, to look at one thing first. First is that what do we currently have? We currently have um, oil, petroleum. And having that as a resource, as much as it has all of those other negative impacts, it is also the only currently existing um, energy source that is already in production phase, you know, which means it's already available for us to use. Um, we also know that in Unity, they have, the government has set up um, with the Russians a small plant that is producing, um, I'm not sure of the capacity, but it's producing some amount of fuel that can be used internally. Um, I think one thing I want us to first try and do is first m work on, 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 on changing the type of equipment that we use so that we decrease the amount of wastage, okay? And when you look at leakages, for instance, from the oil field to old pipes, perhaps one thing that we need to do is um, bring in new pipes, change the pipes that we are currently using. In terms of when, when the production is happening, you know, there is all of those gases that come out. If we're able to put scrubbers on it, perhaps that would be an option that the government can do, and as well as extracting that gas that's coming out. If it's viable, extract it. Um, I'm bringing this forward because uh, this is what we currently have. And I think if we can improve into how we use it and use it in a more um, cleaner method, um, that, would be, that would be a big plus for us. Uh, and secondly, I'm going to move down to some of the things that um, Nyal mentioned. When I look at the issue of hydropower, I think because of the, the amount of investment that is required in hydropower, 
it's 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 better when it's done at a much more bigger level you know because that means you're increasing the amount of energy megawatts that you're getting from it as well as this makes sense when you're looking at return for investment and these are big projects that come back to the government to actually fulfill. I know there are various funders and donors who've been interested in doing that, especially on the Fuller Fall, and various studies were done on Fuller 1, Fuller 2. So that's something that it, a lot of work has really gone into it. It's about just materializing it and government accepting that, okay, we are putting a percentage, whoever is interested to do it with us, let's put a percentage and get it going. Um, as well as there's also Hatire Falls, which is in the Eastern Equatorial region as well. Then I would like to move down into just various ways of accessing electricity. We know that Ethiopia is currently building um, the Millennium Dam. A lot of countries have already gone and contracted, um, paid to get certain amount of that power. That power is hydropower, meaning it's clean energy. Our role as South Sudan is to cooperate with Ethiopia and say, you know what, we need a percentage of that. This is what we're going to pay for it and start building the infrastructure because we don't have a great system. So start building the great system for your 765 KV lines, which are really your high voltage, voltage lines that you can build come through the Pagak region. And of course, this is related to security, right? Because some of these regions are also not well secure, but these are ways that we can access clean energy that currently exist in our regions, in our neighbors. Um, and then I would like to move on to the second, to the third part, which is looking at solar. Uh, person, you find in Juba, a lot of people are using solar, even in the villages, they're using that in their households. And the issue here is that you end up having so many smaller solars and the process of running that as well as buying your step down generator so that the energy coming out of the solar doesn't end up burning your house. It's a bit of a costly aspect on a lot of people. So one way of helping doing this is that you have um, maybe a whole town like Juba, you have on the outskirts where you actually have a full solar farm. And uh, because South Sudan receives over eight hours of solar, of, of sunlight, this this is really, really important energy that we can use. This, these are ones that can be done. Towns can do that jointly or villages. People who really want to use energy can do that jointly and expand that process because this way households pay a much cheaper, cheaper amount to get that. Um, and then if we move on, we look at the aspect of charcoal. Now, as much as there is charcoal that's done from wood, there is also coal, some kind of charcoal. It's called briquettes that's made out of waste. Um, and in some countries, even Kenya, they have a lot of different people that are already doing that. With the amount of waste that we already have in South Sudan, this is an avenue that it's really clean. And it's something that, it's something that perhaps individual businesses can venture into and, and, and do that. And people will buy from them the same way they pay charcoal. And I'll just move on to another part that I think we can also look into, which is biomass to gas. He did talk about, Nyal did talk about using animal dung. Um, and we have all those cows. So we already have a lot of it, a lot of that to use to convert into energy. Um, the issue here is the initial investments that are needed to make this materialize into life. And just to move on to another important part, when we talk of charcoal, you know what our biggest issue is? isn't even only our consumption. It's the fact that we are now exporting it. Uh, I know in the news we have seen there were times when the minister stopped big trucks that were really taking a lot of charcoal to be sold to the neighboring countries because it's become so viable because of the trees that are used. I think a way that this can be also changed because you know what people who use it are going to use it because that's what's available okay our grid system is not going to get some of them in the next five or ten years so another way is bringing in plants trees that regenerate at a much faster faster rate um some of these trees are trees that the wood is a bit light but once you plant it it grows fast and you're able to use those sources that people currently use as much as we are pushing for all of this clean energy, our biggest challenge in Africa is the initial investment that we have. I am really sorry about my 
phone, um, it's connected to my laptop and I haven't managed to find the technical way of silencing it from my laptop. So it constantly keeps sitting. All right, no, I appreciate it. I think we're actually much interested on the great points you're actually putting. Yes, yeah. Thank so, you. I am really sorry about yeah, that. Okay. Um, yeah. And just to make a last point that I want to just um, bring forward, the biggest challenge for Africa is that the current investments that are being done in renewable are so minute, so minute that it's impossible for all our countries who want to move into renewable energy to actually expand into that sector. Um, so in the meantime, if what we have is this, let us expand and do that in a much more healthier, cleaner way. You know, I think this is what I want to, to bring forward to people. Um, and I am going to try and just stop there. Um, and I, I, I just want to, to, to constantly remind people that expand on what you have and use better structures with what you can make um, so that this becomes a process that if you can control it, which is through the type of fuel you use, do so. Um, but we want to make energy poverty, you know. I mean, we want to end energy poverty. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Thank you. No, thank you so much, Sansas. This is uh, this makes more sense, and I think you and Nia have elaborately sort of covered what options do we have if we were to move from what we have, and of course, this is what we have. You know, we can't make drastic change to something we don't have yet. So I really um, like the fact that Jamaj, um, I know you've been having a lot of te uh, technical issues, and our discussion has moved on, and some of the things. So. Uh, just catch up with us, and if you have uh, an addition that you want to make in terms of what are some of the sustainable energy uh, options do we have in South Sudan, as somebody who's already working as well within the oil field sector, right? Um, if you have anything to add on that, you are, you're welcome. All right. Thank you so much, Nyankon, and the rest of the panelists. I actually have been on and off, but I'm glad that I'm back, and most of the the options that we have have already been discussed by Census and Nian. I just want to add the wind energy, which I think at some point we are also we have the the uh, we have enough wind that can generate energy in some villages, uh, which is also a clean energy. But um, I don't know if we have gone to the other challenges or you're still coming for challenges. We are coming to the challenge. So why don't you actually, that's our next. So why don't you actually move to that already? So what are some of the challenges? We've, we, you know, we've mentioned, yes, we have uh, some of these sustainable energy options that we have. But what are some of the challenges that can prevent us, right? What are some of the challenges that, that can actually do prevent us from us transitioning from dirty energy source to cleaner energy source? So yeah, move, move to that. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Thanks once again. Uh, we have very many challenges. Uh, ranging from our capacity, financial, and the rest. But our main challenge now is, I think, financing all these uh, initiatives. And as Sensa said and Nian, that we have the only energy source that we have now is the petrol that we are uh, uh, producing. But the main challenge is that the government is not using the funds from this revenue now to build other infrastructures to make other options available and finance them. So I see from financial part of it is the main challenge that our country is not prioritizing to use this money that we are using now, the money we're getting from this uh, oil to, to build other infrastructure or to improve or develop other oil, uh, other energy sources. And as we know that this source of energy that we are using now is depletable within the next 20 years or even less, it will actually be depleted and may not be available. And it will be so unfortunate for us to start from the scratch because we haven't built the infrastructure that we needed or rather we have not used this money from the oil for developing other sectors. Uh, we also know that this renewable energy, there are a lot of challenges because installing them is very expensive, whether to the country or to individuals, they're very expensive. And not everybody or not every household will actually be able to afford it. So like the wind, 
the solar. We know houses in Juba, there are people who are having, we have the sun is abundant, you know, it's, it's, it's there every time, but most of our household do not have the electricity that we need or we are not actually using it because of the expensive, uh, expensive, uh, because the energy is very expensive, the equipments, you know, the batteries and all this. So that's the main challenge that I see that even uh, that one also applies to the wind and also hydropower. Uh, the other challenges that I see is we will also have challenges actually or problems that will be caused by this energy source to our environment, you know, because when we are installing these facilities, the exploration or mining of these uh, materials that are used for solar energy and for wind actually have, uh, they are very detrimental to our ecosystems and can lead to our biological diversity loss, which in our country, I don't think we also have the capacity to counter attack the effects that will come from this in the future. I think the rest can add and I'll come and add more, thank you. I think Nial as well has disappeared. I think it's having technical problems. I don't know, census, um, are you around to, yes. So now we've moved to the challenges. So, you know, you guys have mentioned, I think you've already mentioned in your uh, proposal, what are some alternative energy, sustainable energy sources? Mm -hmm. What do you think are the challenges that would prevent us from transitioning from the dirty energy that we have to the sustainable options that you guys have just uh, uh, mentioned? Thank you, Nyamach. Um, you did clearly state some of them. I think uh, the biggest part is really the lack of infrastructure. Um, there is a lack of infrastructure, which means um, even if we get somewhere, it's only going to be a major cities that will actually have access. But those within the villages um, will not really have that, unless if these are villages that are highly populated. Um, because you know, the cost of doing business is related to how much of that resource you keep using. So if you are in a big village, then putting on something like a mini grid system makes sense. You know, it's, it's, it, you have the number of people enough to pay for you to generate the amount of, 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 of money you need investment from it. So I think that's, that's an important part. And then the infrastructure. Um, some of these things are strategic uh, goals, strategic goals for a country, you know, versus an individual. So when we look at infrastructure, to be able to construct um, high grid system, um, it's expensive. It's expensive and it takes time and it requires highly trained personnel. We do not have enough personnel for this type of industry. Um, yes, we've seen what's happening in Juba where we have some women as well who deal with electricity and all of that, but our numbers are not a lot, you know, that's not enough for us to expand into all of these great processes. Yes, we have our neighbor Sudan that had managed to build the system all the way up to rank, you know, um, perhaps a part of it is now expanding that and bringing that, that, that power line all the way down. And when you look at power generation, you know, we are talking about two things here. How do we generate power and how do we transmit it? Um, so you need the structures, whether it's your hydro power plants that you're looking at trying to put in the fuller in these different regions, or even the type of small scale um, fuel extraction that's going on in Jongole, I mean, in, in Unity, you know. Um, once you have that, you also now need your transmission. So your transmission are your transmission lines and your transformers that you need in each area to step down the amount of power that's coming from that power source so it's absorbable into the households. Those things are really expensive. I know we've seen in Juba, we've had places where a whole house gets burned because of the great system of the electricity connection. A lot of that happens because that power that's coming from the electricity corporation, it's coming at such high voltage. And we don't have any step down transformers to lower that power so it's absorbable into the household. So we end up having a lot of accidents because of that and some of this can lead to death. So I just want to mention infrastructure as one. A big part is funding. Um, funding whether it's from the international community or even commitment from the government 
to say, these are our partners. We're going to do this with you and we're going to put the money in for it. Um, understanding that we have to do things long term. You know, this is not about getting that energy now. It's about how do you make sure you maintain this and have this working in the next 10, 15, 20 years as peace starts materializing in South Sudan. And this is where I also bring in having cooperation with our neighbors, where you have neighbors that have this resource. How do you borrow that off them, you know, pay to access it from them? So cooperating with Ethiopia, cooperating with Sudan, with Uganda, who already have energy sources, and just linking it to a lot of the towns that are nearby. If we come off um, Uganda into Nimule and just connect the great lines in, th those are fast things that we can do now, but they have a longer plan for where South Sudan can be in future. At a local level, I think what I look at is how do we access solar panels um, at a lower, at a much cheaper amount? Instead of individuals, you know, hackling and trying to buy all of this, how do we make sure that we're able to import it and put a waiver in terms of how much people pay for it, decrease that amount. So that way, if you are not able to give them all that energy, they can at least access it at a cheaper level. Um, so these are ones that I just uh, want to bring forward. And I think we need a lot of awareness um, for people to understand what's happening locally, globally, how climate change is affecting the type of resources we have and access we have. Um, and what we can do in our own front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's actually a part that I wanted us to sort of touch, but I think now seems to be offline. And this is the role of the government, right? This is not our responsibility. We are here just discussing it, right? But we don't have any power to implement some of the ideas or some of the suggestions we are making. And here as well, this is where now we need the legal framework in place. We need the, you know, we need institutions that are in place. So I don't know, um, Sensors or Nyamad, are you guys in a capacity to sort of really highlight in terms of government, what is the challenges? What is the opportunity there for them to sort of move forward? So uh, uh, Sensors, do you want to say something about the role of the government in terms of moving? Um, so I think what I'm going to put forward first is, um, for government to understand those who are in those seats, to understand that energy is the future. Um, your industries cannot operate without having energy 24 seven, you know, access to energy 24 seven. And this means South Sudan will never develop to any type of potential it's trying to get into because the cost of initial investment for any individual to do in the country, whether they're setting up a factory or anything like that, it's going to be astronomical. And um, this even affects education. I mean, we went into a process because of COVID where people couldn't get to school, but in their households, they didn't have any way to access energy for them to access resources online you know so prioritizing and understanding that this is critical for our country critical for our stability it's 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 an important part um another part to move into is that we have to make this initial investment you know it doesn't matter how much we complain of it we have to there is no way out of it it's not going to come out of the blue and nowadays with international donors and funders they don't come and just give you a hundred percent some of them will say, I'm going to put 49, you have to put 51%. You know, I'm going to put 30, you have to put 70. Why? Because the responsibility needs to be on you to own the process and understand you need to manage it as a government. So we 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 have to push, push for all of this, you know, for all of this to materialize. The invest the plans have been put forward before. Um, a lot of our donors already even created all the different plans in terms of, for instance, the waterfalls, the Fuller Dam, the hydropower. A lot of that was all put on the table. The part was from us committing and saying, yes, we're going to do it. Um, so that's those are things that I want to put forward. The great system needs to be, we need to start working on it, no way out of it. Um, decreasing the cost of how much people pay for accessing solar, because currently it's the only individual means of getting this type of power. Um, working with our neighbors so we access energy from them. And lastly, understanding that, you know what, if I need to cook, I will cut a tree for that. It's, it's sad, but that's the only option that I have. 
you know. So I just um, want to put that there and give it forward to Nyamash to add any more that she has. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Census. You have actually covered most of them. Uh, the role of the government. Uh, I just want to add that without peace, we'll not be able to, to actually undertake everything that we want to do. So uh, I see also the role of the government is actually to implement the revitalized peace agreement fully and make sure that there's no fight in other parts of the country so that we are able to concentrate and prioritize on the things that we really need for the next few years to come. And that's one. Number two, you know, our government, or actually South Sudanese in general, we are fan of expanding on things that do not actually pay. So we see the annual budget of South Sudan is huge, and it's actually spent on so many things that are not necessary, things that will not even uh, bring development to the country. So I also see the role of the government in this, in order for the country to invest in these uh, renewable energy sources, we need to cut down our expenses. We need to prioritize, you know, and, 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 and totally cut down unnecessary expenses. We know that many of our, you know, our politicians, they travel across the country, going for so many things, medications outside, and yet this money could actually be used to put up the structures, infrastructure for renewable energy. It could be used like a small town like Terkeka. You know, if you want to use the biogas in Terkeka, they have a lot of livestock and you just need, it, it, it will not cost a lot of money, even though it is, but you can use that money that can be used to do something outside there to set up a biogas station. Uh, in 2012, I went to China in one of the villages and we actually um, visited a biogas production station. And that biogas, they were actually, it was an organic farm where they were using, you know, they, they, they planted crops, they have the poultry, and then the manure from the poultry, it's actually used to generate the biogas. And it was a small, small village. And that uh, facility was supplying 1,300 and something households with that gas just from the manure of this poultry. So I think in our villages, we can also use the same. You know, our country, we have a very small population that I think whatever resources are also sufficient to cater for all our needs. So if the government can shift their priorities to make sure that we want to develop the energy sector, as Sensor said that energy is everything that we need. We cannot operate without energy. If you don't have energy, you will not have something to cook. So if our government can shift their priorities and develop the energy sector, I think this one will actually be the, the, the best things that the country, the country will actually do. So in security, it's actually playing a big role because we remember uh, uh, the street of Juba, they were supplied with, with uh, hello, we were supplied, you know, there was the, 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 the street lights. We had solar panels and they were all stolen. So it, this is because of insecurity. If we can actually put security and we make sure there is stability in the country, I believe we will have a time to sit down and also uh, put the investment for the energy that we need. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, Nial uh, is having a technical um, problem. He's uh, um, he's reconnecting back. Um, the computer that he's using is not. Um, so I think part of what we are and which you guys have already really um, touched on are the challenges, right? That can prevent. And so as we wind down, what are some of your top one? recommendation to the government? I um, know you guys have already discussed various uh, options that we have. What is the top? Um, um, so, okay, just Nial has just come back before we do that. Nial, we were just discussing some of the, what are some of the challenges that we have in terms of transitioning from dirty energy sources to sustainable energy sources. And we were really elaborating the role of the government. Without the government, right, we can't um, do much. So I just wanted you to touch more in terms
terms of what are to enable us to transition. That was the question. I don't know if you, if you heard that. You got me there? Okay. You, you heard me there? You heard the question, right? Okay. No, I didn't get it. Can you repeat it again? No, I'm just saying that as when you just, uh, when you went off, we were talking about the role of the government and we just want to zoom in a little bit more of what mm -hmm. are the institutions uh, the legal frameworks and policy pr framework that are in place. Are they in place or not in place so that they can help us transition from the dirty energy to sustainable one? So I just wanted to sort of highlight what is the government doing, what is in there and what is not there to help us transition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, th thank you very much. And I apologize. You know, my computer shut down and I tried to connect by the phone and it was not allowing me to, to connect for some reason I don't know. So I had to even shut down the, the, the mobile phone again, then, then um, I put it on again and then I was able to connect now. I'm sorry for that. So yeah, uh, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, I think what we have now is uh, not adequate in terms of um, really uh, moving us forward. And, and I see the role of the government as more of a uh, regulatory nature instead of uh, being the one producing because where you see the government uh, being the producer i think there is a lot of uh, inefficiency that comes in because you know anything that is uh, public uh, is not efficient so when you introduce competition so the government is, is supposed to to create a regulatory framework that creates an uh, enabling environment for all actors in the energy sector uh, to do their job in an efficient way. So private sector competitors coming in uh, to, to invest and the investment in, uh, environment is created, uh, both in terms of those uh, investing in um, uh, large, large scale hydro electricity generation and also in small scale and in, uh, in solar, in wind, and in terms of, so I, I want regulation to come in terms of incentives uh, for the sector, uh, because as you remember, uh, all the energy options uh, have to be uh, cheaper for the investors to, to make money. And, and all the forms of energy actually uh, have heavily been in, uh, subsidized uh, for them to, to, to make, for the investors to make money. They've been called now, like people have been calling for the coal to be subsidies for coal, for other uh, fossil fuel energy sources to be lifted. So for us in South Sudan here, we really need to create a range of um, uh, options for incentives. So we need basically a, a, a legal framework or policy framework uh, that puts in place it was incentives and command and control measures to, to control the sector in terms of the who should what 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 the actors should do what the actors should not do uh, this should be the role of the government basically and you know where the money will come will, will be from the investors when the enabling environment is created you know, and you know that you are going to make money in South Sudan, you, people will come in and what we need are res responsible investors. So we, we put in place uh, an effective uh, framework, legal framework. I think people will come in, re responsible investors, people are going to come here to, to develop the energy sector and also make money. Uh, and so, and without incentives, I, I, I'm sure the sector is going to be really difficult. So like some of the, the, the options, the, the, they need a huge upfront cost, which our, our people cannot afford uh, at the moment. And so some of these need to be subsidized uh, or, uh, or incentives need to be given in terms of the tax incentives, uh, in terms of um, also um, credits, access to credits in, in particular uh, and, and you know and, and you know people will be able to to, to, 
to invest and be able to make money. And this is the only way we can develop the sector. Otherwise, if, if, if it is going to be the government only investing, it's not going to go anywhere. So the, I see the role of the government as more of a regulatory nature than the government itself or the public sector, is, sector itself investing. Uh, and then so the, the private sector being allowed and more attracting more uh, responsible investors to the sector to, to, to invest in both the uh, clean electricity and gas and other sectors. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I think our last um, round here is I'm giving you all opportunity each to state um, what is your top one priority. And if, for example, if you were to give something to government and say that, okay, this is what we think that is the way forward. Just with one minute, uh, we are, um, we are, we have exhausted our time. So just now I start with you. What is your top one way forward? And then I'll go to census and then Neil, and then I'll conclude. All right, thank you so much, Yankon, for moderating this. Uh, my one way forward is that renewable energy is what we need. You know, so uh, we need to prioritize. Prioritizing the energy sector is what I would say to all of us, whether it's the government or the private sector, we have to prioritize the energy sector and develop it, develop infrastructure. Uh, let us use the revenue from the oil to build our infrastructure and make sure there is peace and stability so that we are able to attract investors to come to the country. Thank you. Census to you. Thank you, Nyamach. Um, so, Nyanton, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I, I don't want to take too much time. I'm just going to give a few before I go to the government. I want to first give on a local level for individuals that invest in having solar plants for your clinics in your local community. All your MPs receive CDF, which is their Community Constituency Development Fund. Try to get that money to get solar into your clinics so you have power for people to use. Secondly, your town centers get some solar on it. It helps because these are where people meet. People will be able to charge their phones, laptops, and somehow make a difference in their life. Third, for local businesses, um, you can create a business out of solar charging system um, where people come and charge their phones or laptops made out of solar. Take that opportunity. Do the briquettes, you know. And lastly, for government, it's build a great system. So we can, our fastest source of accessing energy is from our neighbors who already have it. Build a great system and access that while you build your hydropower system and solar um, so, solar villages in, in, in South Sudan. So thank you all for this. Um, I really enjoyed the session. Thank you, Nyathon, and thank you to the South Sudan Women Intellectual Forum. Nial, to you. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, like I said from the beginning, it has been an honor uh, to join you. Uh, this is an amazing uh, intellectual group, uh, and I really um, enjoy the conversation, and I have also been following the discussions uh, every now and then. So I think the priority, everything in South Sudan, of course, is a priority and everything is a priority in the energy sector. But I think the number one priority now for the government is to build the, the grid infrastructure, like uh, Sanchez has said. Uh, if we have the infrastructure, the grid in place, I think other things can be put in. Like at the moment, each of us is generating his or her own power in Juba. You have a generator or a solar on your rooftop. But you may have a surplus power and because there's no grid, you cannot sell it to the grid. So we, I think the, the first thing at the moment, that may not be costing money because we don't have a lot of money at the moment. If, if I want to, if I want, if I say we need to build a, a mega project for the Fuller Dam, I think it, it's going to cost a lot of money. It may take time. So short term for me is mini neighborhood grids. The government need to build the grids and organize uh, neighborhoods in terms of so if, if I have the capacity, I can build a small 
uh, wind palm or a small uh, uh, solar palm and I can fit into the grid and I get the money. So the way it works is that it is in Ethiopia and also in East Africa, in, in Kenya too, the feed-in tariff. Feed-in tariff regulation should be enacted by the government of South Sudan. And this will be the, the one that will be used across uh, the towns in South Sudan because feed-in tariff will allow people to build their own uh, power source, generate their own source, uh, electricity, and uh, feed the rest into the into the grid if the government has put in the grid there if the grid is there and then you get paid for the surplus that you feed into the into the grid this is how it functions and it, it, it is an easy a cheaper way and is incentivized in the sense that people are going to produce it businesses are going to do it and they get paid at the moment we are doing it without knowing so hotels are actually feeding into the neighborhood but it's not efficient and it's not effective and it's not safe too so the government should actually prioritize a feed-in tariff regulation to basically support the mini generation of electricity across South Sudan. And then of course, in the medium to long term, five years from now, we need to think about building the, the, the Fula Dam, Fula other smaller sites. And then from there, we'll be able to actually connect South Sudan and enlight the whole of South Sudan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, guys. Um, Sensors, uh, Nyamad, Nial, Miriam, this has been very uh, enlightening discussions. It's very educative. And even though we had a lot of uh, technical problems, we still came through. Thank you so much for taking your Saturday to have this discussion with that on the South Sudan Intellectual Forum. Also, I would like to thank our viewers and especially those who have uh, participated in commenting. And here I could see Luca Molingo and also, you know, there's Abraham Guy, uh, uh, Asentewa, you know, Chawit Nyal. So thank you guys so much. Your discussion as well, you know, uh, sort of uh, com your comments and being part of the discussion as well adds a lot of what we are doing here. So thank you so much for taking your Saturday. Also, I would like to thank the UN Women for their support always, and also for um, South Sudan Women Intellectual Forum for creating this platform for us to discuss our ideas and propose our, um, uh, our, our points to the government. Otherwise, my name is Nyantan Hothmai, and uh, I am the moderator of today, and this has been really an amazing way of spending my Saturday. Thank you so much, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. This Thank has you been very much. Thank you, everyone.